I want to open it up now to, to the floor um, and just to get some, some uh, feedback and some questions and conversation going on also from the floor uh, based on what we've heard, not, not, not necessarily just from this session, but also from the session earlier on this morning. And please feel free to, to introduce yourself as you make your comment and, uh, or, uh, or question and, and let us know who you're directing it uh, to. So please, the floor is open for conversation and dialogue. Um, it's not just us who are sitting or standing up here. Um, where would we like to start? Yes, uh, please. Such. Um, I have a comment, and uh, it draws from the keynote speak, uh, speech uh, by Professor Mangani and also uh, those who have spoken right now. Um, we have talked quite a bit about the role of external forces, uh, the Bretton Woods institutions, and how they are they've tilted the uh, playing ground, so to speak. And I was just thinking about the role of domestic factors in Africa's public debt problem. Even as we go up, uh, at the external uh, issues, I mean, there's lack of political leadership in tackling some of these things. Um, our presidents, our political leaders are not working in tandem with uh, this kind of things that we're talking about. Um, and two, uh, what is the role of the complicity of you know, African governments or African politicians working with some of these multinational corporations uh, that then uh, contribute to IF IFFs. And lastly, also, uh, the lack of technical capacity in terms of you know, assessing and providing prudent uh, policy uh, uh, proposals that we take on public debt. So really, the big question is the role of the domestic factors, even as we look at the uh, international uh, financial architecture. Thank you. My name is Isto Cage from Kenya Female Advisory Organization. This goes to um, Simeon Crystal. The question we are asking ourselves is that we keep on talking about um, feminist economics and yet we find that m in many of the transitions in government we find very patriarchal and for me religious fundamentalists who are pushing back against the issues of freedom of women. And that means investment in spaces where women's work is going to be taken into account is shrinking. So how do we at this level start looking at reframing governments which then push back on women's liberation and ensure that we invest in areas where women thrive. Good afternoon, I'm Danny Bradlow, the Center for Human Rights, University of Pretoria. Um, I, I'm interested that in the, internet, in the African financial architecture, there's no mention of the African Development Bank and minimal mention of the African Export Import Bank. And are there many criticisms one can make of those institutions, but if why do we think new institutions are going to work any better than the old institutions and that it's worthwhile invest, it's better to create new institutions than to work on changing those to work well? And I think part of it also is if we're talking about an African architecture, surely the African continental free trade area is the most important base for that because without that, how are we going to get trade across the continent with all its, its problems? Thank you. Good morning to you all. My name is Judith Ameso. I work with the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development, and my question is to Dr. Nzana. Um, in a practical sense, I think, I think you mentioned the African continental free trade area. In a practical sense, how can we replicate the success that the AFCFTA has had, which in a sense also sort of has its origins in the uh, Lagos Plan of Action under the chapter on trade and, and finance? Um, Don mentioned in his, um, in his presentation um, issues to do with challenges with um, the ratification of, the, of, uh, of some of the um, uh, protocols related to the African financial architecture. And yet when you look at the AFCFTA, between the signing of the agreement and entry into force, it took just about a year and three months or so. And right now there's a lot of momentum on the continent, you know, setting up institutions and moving towards implementation of, of um, uh, implementation of the agreement and Dr. Patrick like you rightly said that if we're not producing then we're going to be back here in two or three years discussing the same things. This is precisely what the AFCFTA is seeking to do. Uh, 
uh, can we produce more among each other, industrialize and trade with each other? So how do we replicate the success that the AFCFTA has had and bring it to these issues around um, the African financial architecture? Thank you. I think for me, I want to pick up from what Okwara said. He's a bit polite on saying internal factors. <laughs> but I want to be more, more bold and say, uh, you know, just bad governance and poor political choices uh, that uh, I think um, African governments take without consulting citizens. The reason why we have a uh, higher uh, level of private sector debts is because of our political leadership. It has nothing to do with somebody putting them to us. So I, I think what we've been discussing has been more of symptoms, but really the real cause of why we are into these problems is largely because of poor political choices and bad political leadership that we elect who make bad, bad, bad policies and who make bad choices in terms of investments they make with the public debt. So I think we really have to nail that on the head and not minimize it that the problem is more global than internal. And I think it would be good to have those discussions. I thank you. Um, thank you very much. I think I'll come back to the floor um, and maybe just start with some initial reactions to some of, some of the comments that have been made. And I think some of them touch really on what uh, Professor Lukushi uh, was saying. And I don't know, Professor, if you're still with us. I know you have um, a meeting that you need to go to. But um, do you want to just touch on some of the, the, the two points made by Vitalis and, and Aquaro on the domestic factors that are at play here that undermine the ability of the African financial architecture uh, from uh, being realized? Uh, let me just say uh, that um, in the uh, overall configuration of, of factors uh, that inhibit us, it is extremely difficult to completely separate the domestic from the external. Uh, they work in tandem. Um, I made the point, for example, that there are forces in the international system that feel themselves completely entitled uh, to Africa and uh, to decide in the place of Africans. Um, and to dislodge them uh, would require quite uh, quite a struggle. Um, uh, I would even say a mass-based struggle, a revolution of sorts. So if you, if you are, for example, uh, working in the framework of, uh, of the CFA, of the CFA Frank, um, there is already a structural constraint uh, uh, on what you can do, even domestically. Um, considering that all of your reserves are kept with the Bank of France, and uh, considering that uh, your scope for uh, any monetary policy making um, uh, is tied to the, uh, <laughs> to the, to the cooperation, uh, to put it that way, of the governor of the Bank of France and his team. Um, and that begins to, uh, I think, uh, underscore the importance uh, of also understanding and mapping the relations of power uh, that are embedded in each of our countries. Um, without necessarily saying that all leadership is reduced uh, to the role of, uh, uh, of, 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 of bearers of external interests, uh, the truth of the matter is that uh, unless we are able uh, to also reconfigure relations of power uh, domestically, in a way that will enable a uh, leadership that is more representative and reflective uh, of the general populace to emerge and to sustain power. Uh, we probably are not going to be able to um, uh, do much in terms of changing uh, that balance of, 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 of forces uh, that tend to work against uh, our interests. Um, and it's not an accident that uh, each time, uh, as was mentioned in the keynote, you come up with the Lagos plan of action. Um, you immediately get the Berg report uh, with the offer of carrots, uh, essentially money to bail you out of an emergency. Uh, and that offer is easily more attractive uh, to, to leaders who are in search of legitimacy and ways of keeping power uh, than to do the hard work uh, over the long term uh, of uh, reconfiguring their economies and, and, and politics in a way that will uh, enable self-sufficiency uh, to be achieved. Um, I would like to, to make one final point. 
which is um, essentially about the issue of funding. And uh, the colleague from Pretoria University uh, uh, made the observation that why didn't uh, uh, um, much of the uh, thinking in the in the 90s uh, include the ADB uh, and other existing institutions, uh, African banking a bit later, uh, but the ADB has been there. Uh, and I think it speaks to my, my point um, that the ownership of uh, uh, the African architecture uh, has to be a precondition uh, and something which we must emphasize. Uh, ownership in terms of uh, uh, control of the resources, but also of the governance of the institutions, of the setting of the agenda. Uh, because for anybody who leads the Africa Development Bank today, a good part of your fight, if you are really going to fight the African battle, is going to be spent trying to manage the non-regionals. There has been a gradual process um, for reasons of uh, 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 failure to replenish uh, the funds uh, of the ADB. There has been a gradual process over the years of what I have called a de-Africanization of the African Development Bank, almost to the point of having embedded externals that exercise a veto over what you can do within the bank. And you can ask Kevin Orama, you can ask uh, uh, Mr. Adeshima himself um, on his High Five initiative, and, uh, and, and you get non-regionals telling you that actually industrialization is not your priority, or we don't even think that the Africa Development Bank should be getting itself involved in industrialization. We think you should be fighting poverty you think you should be putting money in humanitarian causes. Uh, and we got to a point where a, well over 60% of African countries, which are all members of the ADB, were not able to raise money from the ADB because they did not meet the eligibility criteria that had been set up, basically mimicking the criteria that had been defined by the Bretton Woods institutions. Uh, and, and so I think in, think in going forward, ratification is important and we should get um, uh, as many countries to ratify as possible. But this has also to be anchored on a clear political uh, headedness uh, that ensures that we keep full control over the institutions, even if we mobilize uh, resources uh, from outside of the continent uh, and encourage people to invest in them uh, as a commercial proposition, but not as a means of exercising political control over the institutions. And within the continent itself, um, there is a Actually, plenty of scope uh, for us to uh, pool resources in order to run an African monetary fund, for example. Mm -hmm. If you take all of the monies which the Francophone countries of Africa, not with the Bank of France, and you are able to get even a fraction of that lodged with the African monetary fund, and you got big actors like Nigeria, Egypt, South Africa, Kenya, and others to also put their reserves with the uh, African monetary fund, you actually would be making a statement and you would have made a start. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Lux. My name is uh, John Kafka. I work with uh, Youth for Tax Justice Network. I loved the conversation around uh, uh, dismantling the global financial architecture, and I think uh, even the present panel has alluded to it so much. Uh, my question is I really wanted to get uh, a clear-cut answer or a clear-cut plan on how this dismantling can be done, because uh, uh, we've learned a lot from history that uh, you know we've had uh, so many historical persons that have always fought against colonialism, neo-colonialism, the uh, and all that stuff. And of course, for most of them, it has uh, cost them their lives. And I think I don't know whether we are past that time of you know going to the, to the bush and all that stuff. But in the present situation we are in, I mean, I wanted to get a clear-cut plan on how this can be done. Thank you. Um, my name is Enoch Nyorekwa. Uh, I'm an economist. Um, my question really surrounds the political economy of public debt. How do we unbundle this? And it's, it follows the question the gentleman asked, the political economy of public debt in Africa. Uh, my name is Edwin. Uh, I work for Transparency International uh, Kenya. Uh, my question goes to Dr. Patrick um, Olomo. Uh, generally, the excessive 
expenses. Um, actually, public debt is as a result of the military, militarization of the economy. Um, recently, I think last month, uh, at the AU, the ministers of finance uh, met to discuss the debt management in their fifth uh, order session. And one of the key things they were talking about is uh, transparency and accountability. But the bigger elephant in the room is the exclusion, uh, especially of very, uh, key stakeholders uh, within the, the sector. Uh, what best way can we engage um, the AU uh, specific to deal uh, with this uh, aspect of exclusion on debt, uh, debt management, especially at the national level, whereby uh, engaging um, ministries and um, uh, government agencies, including even the SAMLAG, is, um, is actually a task. Okay, thank you. My question is about China and African debt. What is the current situation regarding China and Africa, and what are we doing as Africans with regards to transparency around that debt? Thank you. Thank you very much. Mukasiri. Ndugu Mukasiri is my name with the Stop the Bleeding campaign. Um, my, my question revolves around state capture. Um, we, we, we picked that uh, IMF, despite us voting for the government, uh, those that govern us, they somehow have a way to, in a big doorway or whatever, to influence policy making more. So are we genuine in our discussion of state capture? And uh, yeah, so that, that, that's the point. Uh, so I'll just make three brief comments. First, to endorse what Penelope has said, and this is something my colleague Rangara has been saying over and over again, that external debt in 2017, 2018 was in the region of $770 billion. But at the same time, Anctad and so on reported to us that what we lost in illicit financial flows was $836 billion. So I think those figures should be looked at. We could actually pay it all off and have some change. Of course, there's all issues around reparations and so on, which, which, which should not be forgotten. So I think one is at two. And again, just to endorse, because uh, uh, Bai already answered it, the question asked by, uh, by um, Professor Danny Badlow. I think in trying to hurry, I left out that category, because I did have a category already written out, which I called those banks that we only partially own and other banks that are more in the tree place rather than in this other space and there was the African Development Bank indeed there were the regional banks including regional multilateral development banks like the East African Development Bank the Trade and Development Bank of Comesa and so on and a Frexim Bank so I did have them there I just kind of jumped them and my view is that these are complementary to they serve a different purpose and they are not alternatives to what the core of the African financial architecture wants to do, which is a central bank, a monetary fund, and an investment bank. So it's not an either or. Each has their own purpose. Um, and it is true, especially for ADB and Afrexim Bank, they've been very proactive and very innovative in coming up with tools that support, one, the rollout of FCFTA, two, response to COVID-19, and this year, three innovative tools for responding to the new war in Europe, the Russian invasion of Ukraine. So there's quite, quite some value there. But as I said, these are development and trade institutions. They are not policy institutions. They will not provide an alternative paradigm to the Bretton Woods. And for me, I think that's the use uh, uh, of these others. I had a couple of other points, but maybe let me just stop there. First of all, to respond to the question that was referring to uh, the AFCFTA, ju I just want to, to inform you about the processes of the AFCFTA when it started. Do know and do be aware that the AFCFTA at the starting point was externally financed, mm. externally. We received a grant of 10,000 10 million euro from you know, the EU to engage the negotiation phases of the AFCFTA. It is certainly uh, you know, a homegrown 
project, it is true, that is, you can find it in the Lagos, uh, in the Lagos, uh, uh, sorry? Plan of action. You can see that some allusion was made about it there. But the thing is, when it is financed by an external force, why do you expect from it? Because those guys were trying to find another way of responding to our refusal of the, you know, the so-called, um, uh, how do you call it? No, 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 not the WTO. With the EU, we had this, um, the pass. How do you call it? Uh, economic pass. Economic pass. Thank you. So, the other way around, you know, to impose a pass was to assist us, you know, building the comprehensive single market in which they can let their goods enter because they know that we have weak productive capacities and they know that we cannot address those challenges within even, you know, a, a decade. So the other way to do it was to help us building a commercial agreement, not a productive agreement. And I said it this morning, the key challenge we are facing with regards to building the African economic community is about strengthening our productive capacities through industrialization and economic diversification. So there is need for us to focus mainly on that because internally we have a huge market of about 1.4 billion people that needs to receive you know, some manufacturer's goods. So if we fail producing those goods, somebody else will do it on our own. And they are doing today. Today they are doing. We went to beg for wheat. We can continue that way and you will see that we will not be able to address the challenges that we are facing. So making sure that the AFCFTA works for Africa means that we need to focus on industrialization and structural transformation, what we are not doing at this point. So going forward, going forward. You can imagine all type of, you know, financial architecture that you want to build to strengthen the Africa's capacities to, you know, to mobilize resources. But if you fail on this structural process that leads you to harnessing the domestic market to take advantage of its potential, you will not be able to address any funding issue. And that, I said it this morning, and I'm insisting on that, because you can create all the institutions, and I clearly understand you, you can create all the institutions you want, but if you are not able to raise the money that will be circulating in that economy, you will fail. If you look at the fundamentals of economic, uh, economic theory, as Dr. Mangini said this morning, you will see that there are three factors mainly that produces you know, wealth and money in the economy. You know, the activity, economic activity, you have gold, and you have the credit to the economy. Somebody alluded to uh, the CFA Frank saying that it is a bad arrangement. We do maybe share the same view, but the thing today is for Africans to take the lead in their development process. This goes to the issue of uh, capacity because if we are not able to produce the skills that are needed for tomorrow's transformation, we will not be able to get there, no matter what we can say to ourselves, and there is need for us to understand, if we are not able to stand firm today to make sure that we are harnessing the potential of our continental economy, of our continental market, there is nothing that will happen here. And that goes through an agreement, a firm agreement, to pursue regional integration, to forget about the so-called, uh, you know, national ownership that is hampering the process because people are attached to that saying that no as uh, Malawi we don't want this as you know Kenya we don't want this as Cameroon we don't want this there is need to speak one voice and to decide to move forward that was the main aim of the uh, the, the Abuja uh, treaty and the Legolas plan of action that we're aiming at building one continent, one prosperity, and one shared prosperity. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Patrick. Um, Lucky Star, you, had, you wanted to come in uh, to also on the, the point that was made by Okwaro. Please. 
thank you so much, Jason. And, and I think I, it's good that I'm taking um, after uh, Dr. Nzana. Uh, I just wanted to say one thing that I, I always disagree with when I hear people talk about uh, capacity in Africa uh, with regards to the lack of this uh, capacity issue at the domestic level. We are one of the to me, the most brilliant continent um, uh, I've met, really brilliant people, including the people in, in the room um, and, and also the presenters. So I think the words that, that, that also have been used by Dr. Nzana, which, which we use also here at uh, UNDP, include enhancing or, or strengthening the capacity um, that we have in Africa and, and looking within, and, and which is the theme, which is Sisindi Otuko. So I just wanted to emphasize that uh, we really need to em emancipate our, ourselves and our thinking in order to be able to change the status quo, especially when it comes to things like uh, Dr. Um, Adebayo says, when we, we, we uh, make things very technical, the technicalization of some of these uh, issues that Africa is facing, especially when with regards to, to debt, um, uh, we can easily understand uh, our continent, we can easily understand the issues that we face. So we really need to, to, to enhance and, and, and strengthen the capacity that we have to face uh, future challenges. So, so just to, I wanted to make a comment on that uh, to the room. Um, well, in, in my concluding remark, I think I will say that, uh, um, well, I come from taxation. So, so at UNDP, we do see that uh, DRM is a, is a way to look within. And in order for us to be able to also enlarge the fiscal space that we have um, in Africa and for African countries. And so we do have an ongoing initiative that we launched uh, in April during the ECOSOC meeting uh, that we, we are calling Tax for SDGs at the global level. But at the regional level, it uh, entails uh, DRM for a renewed social contract and, and specifically um, has uh, outputs that, that speak to the issue of, of uh, uh, enhancing capacity, especially in areas that are, that are seen as new and upcoming areas in taxation. Uh, new and upcoming ways, uh, like like on digital tax, um, new and upcoming ways on on, on illicit financial flows uh, from the continent. We're looking at aligning tax policy at the national level with the SDGs, including debt policies um, that should be aligned with the SDGs for the future. And we're looking at the issue of how evidence and perspectives from Africa can actually be incorporated at the regional and and international levels, which means uh, forums like like this uh, uh, that. Africa Dad is launching where um, there is an African voice and an African position and, and we also hear about an African financial architecture that represents our positions also at the, at the African Union level. Um, so in concluding, I'd say that I would really encourage uh, stakeholders in the rooms, government in the room uh, to engage with us at UNDP. Feel free to contact me on, on, on tax issues and tax policy issues and how we can work together and we surely look forward to also working with um, Afrodad um, and continued interaction with Afrodad on how we can contribute to strengthening uh, this African voice and African position when it comes to debt uh, issues and also when it relates to debt and taxation issues, when it relates to debt and uh, gender um, and taxation issues. So, so that's my conclusion. Thank you so much. Back to you, Jason. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lucky Star. Um, Penelope, your, your two minutes, please. Thank you very much, Jason. Um, yes, my two minutes, I think, perhaps, um, perhaps like Pakistan, um, I'll take this as an opportunity to, um, to to advertise the kind of work that we're doing in UNCTAD. And our work really is, as the focal point on debt in the UN, um, is to consider how we can actually expand a new way of looking at debt sustainability. And our key point of departure is to assume that if you are a developing country, the most important constraint you have is probably your balance of payments constraint. And so how do you actually move beyond that and create a, a mechanism whereby you can actually not only service your debt, but also structurally transform? And we are in the process of we are applying the model that we've developed to a number of countries, um, and certainly countries that are interested are um, certainly most welcome to apply for this analysis so that we can see the direction in which countries are moving and how we would recommend uh, they move forward um, in really dealing with these very difficult issues. And then finally, just to make the point that UNCTAD um, 
really works with the G77. And the G77 has a very large African caucus. Um, but to the point that has been raised here very often is that the African caucus does not always speak with one voice. And I think there's this need here and within global UN fora for Africa to develop a session that it does have a voice. Now, the very key difference between, for example, Africa and the EU is that the EU speaks with one voice. And so I think we need mm. to think about mm. how we can actually find mechanisms to provide an opportunity for that African voice to be heard loud and strong. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Penelope. And I think that, that last point is extremely pertinent about the singularity of voice and, and, and cohesion. Policies and practices that put people first.